This is an excerpt from the book In the Jungles of the Night, a novel about Jim Corbett by Stephen Alter. This is from that book's third section, Until the Daybreak, 1953. Jim Corbett and his sister have moved from India to Kenya in 1947. This is 1953 on the Great War, 1917. Page 166. In the course of an eventful and varied life, I have seen supposedly civilized men behaving in abominable ways. At the same time, I have witnessed acts of great dignity and honor performed by people who live in the jungle. The inequalities of our society are greater now than they have ever been. Yet history will record only the superficial advances of mankind rather than the continuing and unconscionable failure to lift our fellow human beings out of poverty and despair. In this regard, the 20th century is no better than the 19th, and I doubt very much that anything will change even after the turn of the next millennium. Humanity is a deceptive noun that suggests our better qualities as a species, though it often masks prejudice and inequality. In 1917, as I have written elsewhere, I volunteered to take a labor force to Europe from India to assist with what has been dubbed the Great War. 500 courageous men from the villages of Kuman traveled with me all the way across the Kalapani, black water or ocean, risking not only their lives but future incarnations as well. For it is often said that Hindus who go be abroad forsake their caste and creed. From England, where we first landed, our men and I were sent to France. Posted safely behind the front lines, our 70th Kuman Labor Corps assisted in building roads and trenches, as well as barracks and even a makeshift airfield. It has been the proudest achievement of my life to lead these those 500 men to war and return home with all of them alive except one. When I think back on that experience and recall the loyalty and dedication of those men who trusted me enough to leave their homes and families for the battlefields in, of Europe, it seems remarkable that human beings are capable of such sacrifices, especially for an unknown cause. Yet I often wonder what those men must have thought until we boarded the train from Kat Gabon to Bombay. Most of them had never traveled outside the hills. The only landscapes they knew were forested mountains and terraced fields. The hardship of plowing rocky soil and waiting for rain to fall and irrigate meager crops. Their homes were thatch hutch and the only source of warmth and light was a simple clay hearth. Almost all of them were illiterate, and none spoke English. Most had never buttoned a shirt before or buckled a belt. Yet they put on their uniform bravely and set off to fight another man's war. They carried shovels and pickaxes rather than rifles, but these were the arms they proudly bore. We were fortunate to be spared the German guns or the mustard gas and bayonets. Most of our time was spent in mundane chores, hauling loads and building trains, while others carried out bloodier tasks. For a while our camp was near a trowel, where battle lines hadn't moved a hundred yards, this way or that, for the past two years. Yellow fields of rape grew nearby, and the men recognized flowers and picked the fresh mustard leaves to cook with potatoes the way they did at home. I often visited the mess tent, where the Kumanis prepared their simple meals. They got the same rations as the rest of us, but didn't know what to do with 
tins of bacon and corned beef. Often I ate with them, accepting a plate of rice and dal. Those familiar spices and flavors took us home to the mountains we had left behind. One night, as I was sitting outside the mess tent with a mug of tea, we heard the far-off rumble of howitzers, and one of the men asked if it was thunder. I almost lied to keep his spirits up, and then I thought better of it and told him these were German cannons. Their bullets reach us here? he asked. No, I said, speaking in Hindustani. Nihi, wo banduk at mil durhe. Those guns are eight miles away. It would take us a full day to march within range of the Germans. He thought this over for a minute. Do you think we'll ever see any Germans? he asked. And how will we recognize them if we do? They probably look no different from me, was the answer I gave. Our uniforms are the only thing that sets us apart. So, there's the Hobbs like you? He asked, bewildered. We could see distant flashes of phosphorescent flares against the night sky where the fighting raged on. By the next morning, the guns had fallen silent and there was an eerie quiet at dawn. I am used to hearing bird calls announce the sunrise, but here there was none. The faint smell of chlorine lingered on the breeze, though it was so diffused it would do us no harm. Then off in the distance I heard a drum. Soon all the men were up and we watched reinforcements march by, an Irish regiment with the officers on horseback and the young men stepping out smartly along the highway that we had just repaired. One of the officers stopped and asked who we were, puzzled to see so many brown faces amongst the mustard fields of France. When I told him these men were from Kuman in the foothills of the Mayas, he looked puzzled. Oh, Indians, he said. Good show. Have you brought any tigers or elephants along? We'll set them loose on the bush. For the next two days, we continued to fill potholes on the road. A boring but necessary task. After nightfall, we listened to the bombardment beyond the horizon. On the third night, I was suddenly awakened by two of my men who said a message had arrived from the front. When I got up to see who it was, a dispatch rider handed me our marching orders. We were to pack up and move forward at dawn. I had no idea what was expected of us, but we obeyed. An hour after sunrise, our labor corps set off, the men marching behind me, carrying their kit bags with shovels and picks on their shoulders. Four hours later, we arrived at a field station about a mile from the front where I reported to the officer in charge. He was in the midst of studying maps and troop placements with his staff. For an awkward moment, he had no idea who I was or why we were there. Finally, it dawned on him. Ah, the coolies, he said with an impatient wave of his hand. We need you to lay out a cemetery and dig some graves. Rutherford will show you where. I saluted and followed the young lieutenant out of the tent. He wasn't more than 19, and I could tell he was shaken by what he'd seen so far. Speaking in a soft stammer, he pointed out a fallow field nearby which had been designated as a cemetery. Ordering men to pitch camp on a meadow between two battle-scarred oaks, we made ourselves as comfortable as we could. The guns sounded much louder, and we could see ambulances bringing the wounded to the field hospital. Lieutenant Rutherford had urged me to have my men start work as soon as possible. By that evening, 
I had paced out the perimeter of the cemetery and we marked a neat grid. First thing next morning, we started excavating the graves. My men knew what was coming and so did I. But we busied ourselves as best we could, acting as if we were doing nothing more than digging more potholes to fill. Each pit was four feet deep and two and a half feet wide. Most of my men were farmers, and they were used to digging in soil. By noon, we had 50 graves ready when the first bodies began to arrive. Though I cannot say for sure, it could have been the Irish regiment we'd seen three days before. None of the dead were recognizable. In most cases, the corpses had been torn to shreds by artillery shells and the wagons disgorged a gruesome assortment of limbs and torsos. Occasionally, something that looked like a man was unloaded, and we lowered him into the ground on his own. Otherwise, we did the best we could, apportioning the remains. Soon enough, the first fifty graves had been filled. We sprinkled lime on each of the pits and shoveled earth on the top of the dead, even as more bodies piled up. My men worked from dawn to dusk, and they had no appetite in the evenings, though I forced them to eat and drink to keep up their strength. It was loathsome work, but none of them complained. I could see the pain in their eyes, not yet not a single expression of dissent. What they had heard of European civilization must have seemed a terrible lie. Over the next ten days we buried more than two thousand bodies, though it was impossible to keep count. By the end, the stench of decomposing had obliterated the odors of cordite, chlorine, and mustard gas that blew in from the front. I never saw the officer who had asked about tigers and elephants again, but I assume he was one of the dead. Often there was nothing left of a man except for a single boot with an anonymous foot inside, the rest of him blown to bits. Even today I have nightmares, and I'm sure every one of those men who came home from with me suffered traumatic memories long after the Great War ended. While hunting man-eaters, I have seen the mutilated remains of victims killed by tigers and leopards, but nothing can compare to the savagery and desecration we witnessed on the field in France. Our labor corps was spared the enemy's bullets only to look death squarely in its hideous face when mud and flesh became one substance and bones are shattered like sticks. I do not know if the commanding officer who gave us our orders survived the war or not, but if he did, and if he ever reads this account, I want him to know that my men were not mere coolies. They were unsung heroes who conducted themselves with resolute honor, showing utmost respect for the dead. Last year, her Majesty Queen Elizabeth visited Kenya. She was still a princess then, and I was invited to accompany her and Prince Philip when they came to treetops to photograph wildlife. After several hours observing elephants and other creatures on a salt lick, they spent the night in the lodge, which is probably the most luxurious treehouse ever built. By a tragic coincidence, King George the Sixth, who was hunting grouse in Scotland, suddenly died in his sleep that same night. This sad news only reached the royal party after they had departed treetops. But in the lodge register, I recorded an account of their visit and concluded with a brief note. For the first time in the history of the world, a young girl climbed into a tree one day, a princess, and after having what she described as her most thrilling experience, 
She climbed down from the tree the next day, a queen. God bless her. Despite the sorrowful ending, we enjoyed a magnificent time at treetops, and Her Highness took many photographs of rhinos, baboons, and water buck. This has been Phil McEldowney, reading from Stephen Alter's book on Jim Corbett, an excerpt for about the Great War of 1917, read on the 13th of January, 2019.